Hello everybody and welcome to another comedian's interview for my blog and podcast A Rich Comic Life. My name is Richard Gill and my blog describes my experiences of watching over 800 stand-up comedians and counting during the last 46 years. I am honoured and delighted today to be chatting to one of my favourite comedians. It's only Mr. Jason Byrne. Yay! Yes. 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 Hello, mate. How are you? <laughs> well, finally, it's great to see you because, like, if people who are listening and watching, whatever, don't don't realise that Rich has been a great support for me. So the minute I went into lockdown, I had to stay in my house. I started doing online training that Rich yeah. joined in with. Uh, I had to do like city sketches that Rich has been like, and then the the Sunday check ins. The oh, it's the been brilliant. Yokes and the jacks. They're like, oh my god! I'm literally like, you know, it's just insane. I've just I've tried. I've tried everything, and Rich has been there. He's like, some well, sort I can't of, thank you enough because you've you've helped make my lockdown, mate. You really have. Oh, you're um, so nice. Um. Let's go right back to the start of your career. As I say, you're one of my favourite comedians. Mm. Please, can you tell me, how did you become a comedian in the first place? Well, well, I always think it's, it comes from your... Um, a lot of people say, like, you know, the, the funny bones, and it comes from your, your upbringing as well. Yeah. So I think that I was already a kind of a fun guy anyway, you know what I mean? And I used to sign people's copy books in school. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and, but I, I, but the, I had an idea I might be in a band. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I'd be sitting there and be there going, that's for you there and that's for you. And people would be like walking down the corridors of the school and I'd stop them and I'd take out my pen and I'd sign on their bag and they'd be going, what are you doing, Burn? I'd go, that's for you, you know, just you know, in the future. So, and then it went on to, um, before Father Ted actually came out, I, uh, we used to have, we had a nun that was our maths teacher. And so I would have been about uh, 16, 15, 16. And we used to have to pray before our lessons, right? Which is just insane when you think about it now. <laughs> and so one day, my brother was in a choir, a school choir in his school, but he had to wear like a cassock thing and a big wooden cross, right? Insane Catholic carry on. And I borrowed that cross and I brought it to my maths class because I knew she couldn't tell me to take it off because she's a nun, even though it was ridiculously big. It was like huge. It was like about half a foot long. And I had it hanging out of me. And so when we were doing the prayers at the start, I was like holding the cross in my hand and like properly kneeling at my desk. And she was just, <laughs> she was furious. So I had everybody in the class as father somebody or sister somebody. Like, like just like Father Ted. So I was Father Byrne and there was Father Newman. And then that's, Kind of where it, I mean, and then at home in my mom and dad's house, we watch comedy all the time on TV. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So we loved Billy Billy Connolly, like all that kind of stuff. I, but I didn't really think I was going to be a comedian. I don't think any comedian really thinks they're going to be a comedian. Like we all have this either a working background, we've already had a job, or we were yeah. in college, or we were heading to a different. Like, yeah, the comedy world is just full of wasted degrees. <laughs> 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 so, so did you start off in pubs then? Was there was there a moment mm. where you were doing five minutes in pubs, or how did how did you get your first big break? Oh my God! Well, when I did my first ever talk into a microphone, you know, and now and that's really weird when you hear yourself going through speakers because <laughs> you're literally like this. And you go, what the hell is that? It's a bit like, do you know, like when you when you go to a wedding and the father of the bride stands up and he's never used a mic. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll literally just go, and she's gorgeous and, <laughs> and it's, like, it's, like, it's like back off the mic, you freak. So that's happened to me. That happened to me my first gig. I, I was asked to host um, because I was a funny, fun loving guy. I was 21. Right. I was asked to host a local charity gig. Um, where, where, and this is the actual words that were used, where two local nurses were going to look after AIDS babies. Right. So it's stuff that you can't even say. <laughs> like now you can't say anything. And you certainly, like, those, these babies were in Romania. That's all you have to say, ill children in Romania. But no, no, we're getting money for the AIDS babies. So we need you to do a charity gig. It's gone. Okay. So I hosted that. And I didn't know what to do because I only ever seen Billy Connolly doing stand up. I sure. seen comedy, whatever. 
and I just got up and I just kind of told silly jokes from actually from Viz magazine. Right. I'd seen a couple of jokes. So you know what I mean? They used to do their letters. Yeah, I used to yeah, read yeah. Out some, yeah, no, but, well. But I used to read out Viz letters on at that gig. So anyway, died on my arse, right? <laughs> So, and there's actual footage of that. I don't know, I have to try and find where it is now, but there's footage of me of, as I'm talking on the stage, people queuing up in front of me to go to the bar. Wow. And they're not even, they're not even listening to me. And I'm going, do you know when you're in a, in a football, hello? And I go, oh. so, anyway, so that, w- that went to the wayside for ages. So it wasn't until I was about 24. Right. I went to a, stand-up gig and I remember do you, do you know uh, Simon Bly do you remember oh, him very well yeah, yeah 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 Simon was doing a headline act in Dublin in the place called the Castle Inn and I loved all those guys because it was like Parrot was there yeah he wasn't on the same night but they used to come once a month right Parrot came um, Incognito who passed away as well yeah, him he yeah, was there that was old, all yeah. these fellas who I would end up working with didn't even know so here I am sitting there watching Simon Bly um, I'm loving him He's he's got this big mad eyes, loads of energy, and I'm going, this is brilliant. So then it's like there's a joke competition, and this is my first, and I would not you say the word big. This is the first time I ever broke into comedy at all. This is where it all started. Was it was a joke competition. And the MC that was doing it was an Irish guy called Barry Murphy, and he was quite a surreal head because he was actually in a, a comedy trio called Mr. Trellis with um uh Ardlo Hanlon, which right. is Father Timid. Barry Murphy and it was uh, Kevin Gildee and Dermot Carmody and they were oh, in this it was, it was a trio but a four if you know what I mean so Dermot used to step in and out but the main three were Kevin Gildee Barry Murphy and Ard Lahanna so uh, Barry's MC and as a core and if you ever look you'll, you'll be able to Google her so if you might yeah. find some surreal stuff from his trellis so he loves surreal shit so his gag to the audience was what's the difference between Mary Robinson and Eamon de Valera and Mary Robinson who was our uh, she was our president at the time, and she's now um, she's now if you might she she was a president for the for the UN, and uh, actually most recently she got in trouble for having lunch with uh, the Dubai King's daughter, do you know, right. do you know? Right. and um, didn't really and this is when now this is before she went missing and didn't realise that your woman was in trouble. But anyway, right. anyway, anyway, I digress as they say. So the question was, what's the difference between Mary Robinson and Eamon de Valera? And he was a very old president of Ireland in the rising times and like all that stuff. And um, so most people wrote down kind of good answers. And I wrote down, uh, my mother doesn't live beside Eamon de Valera, right? <laughs> Which was complete bollocks and jar- didn't mean anything. <laughs> I just put it down and then Barry Murphy's reading because you know you because that was have you ever been to a comedy club where you write the things down on a yeah, bit of paper? Yeah, 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 yeah. So next minute he reads out my joke and he goes, <laughs> and, and people are kind of gone, huh? And Barry goes, Yeah, that's the winner. I like that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I like that. So Jason Bird's the winner of that one. So you can collect your Foster's hat afterwards. <laughs> brilliant. That's so I went brilliant. down, I met I was with my mate Martin Byrne and Barry Murphy, I got me Foster's hat. And Martin Burns said, oh, he'd love to do comedy. He'd love to do stand-up. I went, no, he wouldn't. He says, yes, you would. And Barry Murphy had this blue book. He still has it. And he took it out. And this is where he would put acts into the comedy cellar. Right. Uh, in, in Dublin. Uh, and I and he said, I'll give you seven open spots. And if you don't like it, it after that, don't do it anymore. Right. And this was, I was like, oh, Jesus. But you see, I was a nightmare. I was, uh, if I was dared to do anything as a kid or anything, I always did it. So this is like, I couldn't turn this down because I was always had this feeling in my chest. I should really, if I never tried something like that, I never would do it ever. Exactly, I would yeah, never have yeah. done it. I would never have done it ever, I don't think. So it was real weird fate thing that brought me there. And, um, and the comedy center was the first place I gigged. And wow. What, what year was that? So 1996 was, so you think you're funny, yeah. 95 probably, right, right, right. probably 95. And all my mates came to the first gig, like five minutes. Wow. And it was so exciting. And I was like, uh, um, it was a comedy cellar, it only holds about 60 people. And it's called a comedy cellar, even though it's upstairs. So yeah, the gag's yes. there already. Yeah. And this is where Dylan Moran would have started. Andrew Maxwell was there. Ed Byrne uh, wow. would have started. Tommy Tiernan, Darrell Brin, all all cut their teeth in that room. And so I'm there, and uh, oh, I have a I have a crack in five minutes. I mean, I literally have a great time. It's my first time ever in a comedy club. But because you're in a comedy club like that, and all, it wasn't like the charity gig because the charity gig was like a corporate gig. Right. Little did I know, I was trying to do something that I wouldn't even do now. 
If someone asked me to do a gig in a pub with a band <laughs> for two nurses going to Romania, I'd go, fuck off, I will in me whole do that. You know what I mean? So I was I was actually put in into one of the hardest jobs ever. Oh, sorry, there's lights. So anyway, I did the gig and I had a stormer because uh, my girlfriend was there, my friends and family, right. woohoo. And then I went back the second time, and this is what I'll, I used to advise, you know, comics. Like, be ready when you go back the second time when now it's a room full of strangers. <laughs> So now it's not. They don't know you anymore. They don't give a shit about you. They don't. They don't know nothing. And they're staring at me. And now I'm really struggling. I'm going, oh shit. So I just got away with that. So all the time I was learning, but I got, I got fat. I got good very quick. Do you know what I mean? Because I had. Yes. To, yeah. 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 Because confidence is the one of the biggest things to have in stand up, and that doesn't mean, uh, you know, roaring and shouting confidence. It's just stage presence. Because some of the one liner guys, like you know, like Jack D, Jimmy Carr. Yeah. Yeah they've got great confidence because you can just see it in them. But yeah. you'll always, you know, all the years in that comedy cellar, I've seen all the, the fellas on the stage, <laughs> top, uh, and then, the, uh, sure, sure, once I was MC in that club, and um, there was a guy in who was, and his mates, you know, convinced him, oh yeah, by the way, here's another bit, another tip, if your mates say you're funny in a pub, do not get on stage, right? <laughs> it's absolutely... I can my hand up to that. Right, Riz, but it's got, it's got nothing to do with anything, you know what I mean? Like a bloke <laughs> in a pub being funny, like he's just probably an arsehole anyway. And so this guy, his mates all came, and, and they're all in the, they're all what? They're all going, ah, oh, Terry's coming on, he's brilliant, Terry's coming on! So I went, ladies and gentlemen, you know, Terry O'Reilly, or whatever the fuck is that. <laughs> and, and he'd gone. <laughs> he did, he must I, have been. I, uh, I was exactly like that. I thought I, thought I could have a go at doing stand-up mm. comedy uh, because I'd supported them for so long and I thought to myself I've got to have a go at this folk think I'm funny in a pub and I went on a gong competition this is legendary I went I went on oh a God. gong competition in is that where they hit the bell if you if, if you have to get off early yeah yeah yeah, yeah. if they thought I was rubbish they had to gong me off and I did, this, I did this script about crushing cars in Carlisle which the promoter <laughs> loved and I walked on <laughs> And there was three people in, in, in the room, three old fellas. And I said to them, killer line. I said to them, um, uh, uh, people think I look like Eddie the Eagle Edwards, but I can't see the resemblance myself. And I'm the double of him. And yeah, some old well. bloke at the back just went, fuck off, and got me <laughs> off. And I was looking up to me. On well, first listen. Steps. And I thought, never again. I'll, I'll never say never again. But no, I, well, I, 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 I would... Um, basically what I'm saying there is but I wouldn't give up straight away do you know what I mean no. that's too soon so but the the fella in the pub is you see I'm not I don't see you as that stereotypical fella in the pub <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking oh, about? I'm like talking about in the pub. <laughs> no, no, but I'm talking about the in the corner where you yeah, hear yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear the way. Hey, oh yeah, way. That fucking idiot. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one who hasn't got a clue what he's exactly. walking into. It, uh, but it, you it, have got a comedy knowledge at exactly, least. Exactly, mate. Yeah, that's that's so, that's the reason for the blog. So that that's a different dude. <laughs> But, but but I'll still stand by if you're made to the pub say you're funny you're not you're not no um, uh, <laughs> you're no, I agree let's let's move on to confidence you're one of the most confident comedians I've ever seen and that's a magic quality that you've got you're superb with an audience um, mm. how do you cope with any nerves do you get any nerves before you go on stage how do you cope with it just before you go on stage well I've loads of lovely nervy stories because I used to um I used to I used to basically get myself into a terrible tizzy because right. I thought if I pranced up and down a dressing room or I, you know, went oh my god okay 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 gotta do this gotta do this okay 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 I thought if I did that that I I, I, I was almost building up this energy of like a shield on stage <laughs> where I could just get up get up it's like being like wind up a toy like you remember Evil can Evil you wind them yeah, up yeah. <laughs> and then you let them go that's basically what I thought I think that was my logic. I thought, if you wind me up loads, I'll just go on stage and I go, I won't even know it was and I'll leave. And I go, just take that, it's over. But, so you, so yeah. you did get them? Yeah, they were ridiculous then. And a lovely comedian called Sean Hughes has now passed. Oh, is the yeah. one, is the one who, he took me down from eight gear down to one. Right. Um, uh, what, actually, no, that's that's a lie, but he's the one who actually kicked it in. But the first person ever said it to me was Mark Lamar. Right. And that was at... Um, 
that was at a So I Think You're Funny final. And me and Tommy Tiernan were there, and John Henderson, Patrick McDonald. There was four Irish people in the final. And K Karen, Karen Corran, who runs the final, was furious in Scotland and Edinburgh. She was going, fucking Irish bastard, furious, <laughs> Christ. So we were kind of walking around. There was no no noise at all. And Mark Lamar had his feet up on the table with a cigarette in his mouth. And he was going, what the fuck is going on in here? <laughs> <laughs> he's going, he's going, what did I say is all he's going, you know, none of this helps. None of this helps. <laughs> whatever you're doing, whatever you think you're doing now, just sit down and fucking relax. So, but then I got a really like, so then I used to always prance around backstage before I went on. And then I was in, again, I can't remember what venue I was in with Sean Hughes, but me and Sean were just backstage and I was, I was walking up and down, like literally like, like a bear in a cage that wants to get out. And Sean just went, right, Jason, Jason, sit down. And I went, oh, I can't, I can't. He goes, just do it, just do it. Let me talk to him. And I went, what? And he said, how many gigs have you done? I went, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, I don't know. And he goes, yeah, yeah. So, how many times have you died in your arse? And I went, I don't know, of course, like a handful of times. He goes, yeah. So, that means that uh, we reckon, and you know, by the by the averages and everything, that you're good at doing stand-up, right? <laughs> so we said, sit down and shut the fuck up. And stop being so nervous. And that was it. And from then on, I never, pranced around so if I'm playing like a big gig like a thousand seater or four thousand yeah. seater I, 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 I now control my nerves yeah yeah and what I love actually the best which I can recommend but some people don't like this but I think it's great is having your mates in the dressing room with you um, because if you don't know your, your lines and your words by you know on the night just for, you're not going to anyway yeah yeah but my, my love to bring my mates into Vicar Street like I had a big uh, dressing room in Dublin and my mates were in there just taking the beer out of the fridge and going this is great is this your job Brilliant. holy shit yeah. and they're like going, Shh. and I remember one time I went to go on stage they're going you going out lads and they went nah there's a match on the telly <laughs> and three of them sat in my dressing room and watched the match and drank me well, beer <laughs> didn't even go out and I felt so relaxed because they had I bet no show I bet that was great yeah, because it's a bit of normality, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, in in yeah, such yeah. a crazy time. But my nerves, um, I control my nerves and then I, I just have controlled nerves now. So I'm always, um, you know, you don't know what the audience are going to be like. People yeah. always go, but you know, you've been to Liverpool, you've been to Manchester, yeah. but it's still a different amount of people, again, different types of people. Yeah. And depending on what's happened to them that day, like the, the, it's see, music is brilliant. You can come out and you can whack out songs. And, you know, you're not really... Sh I mean, of course, if people are just sitting there stone-faced, they must fucking hate you. But, like, if you you can rock out songs even if you're not in a good mood. You can just rock them out. They mightn't be the best, you know, rocking them out. And then people watching them, even if not in the greatest mood, they can still enjoy it. It's grand. Yeah, but with yeah. comedy, comedy has to be the perfect storm. Everybody has to be in the right mood, yeah. in the right mode, and so does the comic. And I always say... And a lot of comedians will tell you that it's like we get into the groove like it's almost like on, a, on, on an album right that means the audience and the comic are, are all now in sync right. and that is when the gig works great but but if you put that down on paper and said to somebody like it's like a, like einstein he, he'd be going this is insane how can this work this is the mad equation what are you trying to do here you're trying to get all these like a thousand people in the room to think the same way it's like one big brain has yeah, to come up yeah. But yeah, so you're only we're only anxious about what what the audience are going to be like. It reminds me of the old Ken Dodd story where he describes um, he describes what it's like to to laugh at a, to be part of an audience and laugh. And he said mm. the laugh starts in the gut and it works its way up. And he he describes this very elongated way of laughing. And then he said, and, th and then he said that was by Freud. Freud said that. Mind you, ladies and gentlemen, Fro Freud never played Glasgow Empire on a Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking hell. Tell me, you know, that it was extraordinary just to go out there and to oh, he was, make he, him laugh. He was extraordinary. Very yeah, I did. I, I did a Royal Variety show with him before oh, he died. Brilliant. And we were in rehearsals because when you do a Royal Variety show, only the acts are allowed in the room. Yeah. Like literally, everybody else has to leave the building while the um, the cops come in with their dogs and all to make sure. So, like, so there's of course the techies are allowed there and the acts, but all the other, all the staff have to go, all the agents have to go. So you're sitting like in the weirdest thing. You're sitting in the auditorium with like Robbie Williams and take that, and you're all just sitting in seats like kids, and and everybody takes a turn at their act. And Ken Dodd got up, and a lot of time the comics will, will do a thing called topping and tailing. I'll say, look, I'm going to come on, I'll say this, 
because there's no audience there, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's embarrassing to have to do your own fucking act like that. So I go, my, I says, I got to do this and then that. And, oh, and then I'll end on this. And I go, okay, Jason, brilliant, thanks. Okay, Ken Dodd, Ken did his whole act. <laughs> <laughs> he did it like he was doing, and he came off and and, he, and he, as he's walking off, he goes, no kids, that's how you do it. <laughs> and then he said, and he said, um, the reason why he did it, because he's such a pro. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because it's televised, so now they have two versions. Yeah. Of because you can't see the audience when they, when you're watching the game. you have no idea that Ken Dodd is on. He didn't give a shit though. He was just like rattling away as if we were. But mind you, we were laughing and clapping because it was. <laughs> he's got like proper jokes, like it's brilliant. He is, he is extraordinary. I've seen him many, many times, and he, he was one of the greats. Mm -hmm. Um, let's move on to the Edinburgh Festival. I I am very lucky to be able to go to the Fringe every year. I've been going since 2005 and I uh, um, uh, I love to go. I see about 50 shows in a week uh, and I just... Wow, I, I and just is it just comedy or is, is that just comedy? I, uh, it's comedy, plays, music, but the majority of it is, is comedians. Um, can you tell me what your first Edinburgh Fringe was like? What what year was it? What what feelings mm. did you have about it? It's uh, I think yeah yeah it's ninety six. That was so I think right. you're funny. Yeah. And we had to do these heats in Derry in Northern Ireland uh, or London Derry depending on how orange or green you are. Right. So <laughs> like uh, so so we went to up to Derry. Patrick Kilty was hosting it. Right. And so we had to we had to do this weird I don't know I, I was just Karen Corrin trying to make more money again. But anyway. <laughs> We got in, we got in, we, we got into the heats. Well done, Jason, you're in the heats, which is like, well, okay, thanks. So we flew over, <laughs> flew over to Edinburgh, myself, Paddy Courtney, Bob Riley, another friend, Mike, all these comics that we all got into the heats. And um, we we know where to stay. So we, fa we found these nurses who are a grey crack and they let us stay with them, who were Irish nurses yeah. in Edinburgh. And so we stayed with them and we just thought we wouldn't get through, you know, through the, through the heats. So, um, uh, my friend Paddy, he didn't get through, so right. he but he stayed on, and then I went to my heat, and Dominic Holland was one of the judges. Brilliant, yeah. So every time I meet Dominic, I go, you know, it's your fault. <laughs> and Dominic goes, I know I have one of the most famous sons in the world, Jason. You know, like Tom Holland. Yeah. And he goes, but well, my proudest moment is putting you through. <laughs> oh, brilliant! That's brilliant. But I was like. I was like, wow. And Dominic still, oh, he's such a beautiful man. Anyway. He's hilarious. Very isn't he brilliant? brilliant? Yeah. And yeah. such a gent. Yeah. So I got through and now I, now I still have nowhere to stay. So the nurses are saying, oh, you might as well stay with us. Another friend of mine, John Henderson comes over. He wins his heat. Patrick McDonald wins his heat. Yeah. Tommy Tiernan wins his heat. Yeah. There was a load of paddies in Edinburgh all together in one circle. I mean, we had literally only started doing comedy in Ireland. And now we're all together going, this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Because we had to stay on, and I, I can't remember how far away my heat was from my actual, from the actual finals. But the finals are, are nowadays are normally near the end of the festival, the weekend. So I probably was probably there for a good week anyway. Right. Before, and then I went in, and then and as I said, yeah, Mark Lamar was hosting, and we did the gig. And um, what happened was, uh, which I found out afterwards, because uh, Phil Kay was one of the. Oh, he's the judges. Phenomenal. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The hey. best improver on stage yeah. in the world ever yeah. and other people go no i've seen better it's it's no. it's not it okay maybe on paper you might see somebody better or whatever maybe but in phil order, in order to desperately him. get laughs he would moon at the audience yeah. no but then he would <laughs> but i've seen but he would always take a room up to absolute hysterics and loving them <laughs> yeah. to where he wanted them walking out <laughs> and then my one wasn't my favorite things to see him do i see him do, do a gig in ireland i went to go and see him and uh, he came on he went hello hello and he had a, a a jug of milk and he poured it on a pole which was like a big pole uh which was like you know one of the beams in the venues yeah. and he, he started just grinds up and down and trying to make uh trying to make cheese <laughs> with milk he's going to, to make cheese with the milk the grind on we're all going this guy's fucking brilliant so all of us and then anyway so phil was one of my judges and yeah. uh, karen corran and uh, was there one other? I think there was another, a third judge. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, yeah. So they took ages to work out who was going to win. So we'd all performed. I did really good. My opening part of my act was I came on with fake legs, on, like basically as my own legs. I had a black dress hiding my own legs, and I came wand waddling on sideways. So 
Bill K. That was it. I was the winner. It was like it didn't matter what I did after that. Was he was like Kay. fucking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fantastic. So anyway, what happened was Karen and Phil fought a lot in the, in, in the judges' room because Phil wanted me to win and Karen wanted Tommy Tiernan to win, and um, so it came out anyway. And because Karen, Karen was like, and Karen said to me, "It's my fucking competition. I own it." <laughs> So it was announced that Tommy won by a point, oh, by one nice. point, whatever that means. I came second. Yeah. And then John, John Henderson, another Irish comedian, he came third. Yeah. And then for some reason, they announced the fourth comic, which they never do, which is Patrick MacDonald. Wow. So it was first, second, third, fourth for all the Irish. So um, when did your first solo show appear in Edinburgh? Right. So then we do that. And now the agents start coming in, which was brilliant. And my my whole agent story was great because Arthur and Graham that wrote Father Ted were big fans of mine, yeah. and they used to go to my gigs in London and everything. And then Don Sedgwick, who was the, who was uh, Simon Pegg's agent, yes. Ardell's agent, yeah. uh, she was brilliant. And she um, anyway, so she took us on. So then I was I was to do uh, uh, share a bill now with Tommy Tiernan right we should, oh, we should go, what a, go, to, what that, go to that way yeah go that way first I'll summarise it for you so we went to Edinburgh we were in, a, we were in uh, the Gillet Balloon before it was burnt down down on Cowgate right and it was about a, about a 100 seater right Ed, Ed Smith uh, Stone Ranger were, were, were um, our promoters yeah, yeah. and uh, so anyway did the gig and on the first night Tommy said can I go on first and I went, yeah, 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 sure, whatever. We've got like fucking 20 something nights. And he goes, yeah. And he says, he said to, to the techie, look, listen, when I have about uh, uh, 10 minutes to go, will you flash the little light there? And he went, yeah, yeah, sure. And he goes, okay, brilliant. So Tommy went on and he did about five. So he's supposed to do half an hour each. So he did about, I'd say he did about 10 minutes, right. maybe a bit more, 15 maybe. And your man, lit up his light to look at something on his board and Tommy went tight for much good night <laughs> and I, I didn't have more than half an hour and I had to go on to like and fill 40 minutes because oh, <laughs> I came off and I'm, trying, I'm saying to Tommy you're off early you're off too early he's going oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so anyway we did that run a very amazing run because I was I got a part in a movie in right. the general uh, which was a which is a Brendan Gleeson movie, a general about the Irish, an Irish gangster. You can all Google that now and have a look. Right. But but Brendan Gleeson came to Edinburgh to see me and Tommy in in uh, Acton. What an actor, yeah. And I was going, wow, this is cool because Brendan wasn't massive then. It was like ninety six, ninety seven. Yeah. And uh, he was, he, you know, he was in Braveheart and things like that. He had been in all those things and like just been a, a, really making it big now. And so he came to see us, talking to him afterwards. He's like, oh, well done, Jason. Can't wait for being in the movie with me. He's going, oh, yeah, can't wait. And then the maddest thing that happened to us down at me and Tommy was, a couple of weeks later, Ray Davies came to our gig. Oh, the lead, wow. lead singer of the Kings. Wow. So he was just wandering in and out of gigs that he didn't wow. know. He, he wanted to go to gigs that he didn't know who anybody was. Wow. So he came on stage and Ray Davies comes in. And I'm like, oh, holy shit, it's Ray Davies. <laughs> And then, okay, to top it all, in that room, because that was the most fun I've ever had in comedy, Brilliant. because straight after us, Johnny Vegas was doing his oh, first ever hour. Well, yeah. First ever hour. Wow. And I became very good friends with Johnny. Brilliant. And I end, I used to have these rubber hands on the end of a stick. <laughs> and uh, Johnny asked me one night, because Johnny used to get a member of the audience uh, to, to do the pottery. Yeah. So he had his potter's wheel, and he'd sit behind them, and like the ghost movie. <laughs> And he'd take off his he'd take off his top. He'd take his top off and they'd play the music and it was I swear the I'll audience were crying, crying, <laughs> crying like, like like nowadays like that might be like sexual harassment or you can't be touching around. But it was fucking brilliant comedy. <laughs> we were crying laughing and there's Johnny and his pottery for clay going everywhere. So Johnny asked me to do one night with him with, wow. with my rubber hands. <laughs> So near the end, near the end of the run, I came on with my rubber hands topless, and I'm behind Johnny, and he's topless. And we never, of course, it's never been recorded. We've never seen it. So all of that, all of that, all of that, and then I went home and did. Um, I lost a stone in weight because me and Tom, because uh, years ago in Edinburgh, the last week used to be a party every night. So there'd be yeah. Universal yeah. Party, Channel Four, yeah. ITV, and they'd be all like, because that's when everybody had loads of money. So yeah. like. I remember doing shots in an, out of a swan eye sculpture. <laughs> this is so then we, uh, I went back and John Borman, who was the director of the general yes. movie, John Borman directed Deliverance. You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And John lived in uh, Ireland 
And uh, John looked at me and went, what the hell happened to you? You've had to lose so much weight. And I went, I uh, was in Edinburgh for the first time. Me and, Tommy, <laughs> me and Tommy just had that crack. We were there going, holy shit, we don't do half an hour. We get free drink everywhere and it's brilliant fun. And you sleep all day. So they had to bulk wow. me up and I did. I, I, I managed to do the movie. I only had a couple of lines in it. Yeah. And one of the lines in it was, did you rob the Beit paintings? B-E-I-T, which are Dutch paintings that the general robbed in Ireland. Uh, and he tried, I think the IRA or something was something to do with it as well. And I kept saying be it, like B-E-I-T instead of bite. Right. And they had, they had, it took nearly four times to do it. And this was the day of film, not digital cameras. No. And this was a massive scene outside on a street with buses and rain and everything. Yeah. And, and uh, Brendan Gleeson with his hand over his face, <laughs> he's gone, he's gone, okay, Jason, before we shoot, he goes, you know, you know, it's bite, don't say be it. I go, okay, got it. And every time I just came in and said, did you rob the be it paintings on here? It's cause, holy fuck. <laughs> holy shit. John Borman is, you know, do you know, you know one of those seats with the cameras? Yeah. With the crane. He's on one of them. He just comes out of the sky and down in front of me and goes, are you fucking joking me? So, so anyway, yeah, that was it. And then I went, and then a really amazing thing happened, like was I uh, went back to Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, I was doing other bits of movies and bits of things. And I was trying to decide whether to be stand up or do an acting because Don Sedgwick was a brilliant um, co uh, acting agent as well. She took on Catherine Tate and everything. Right, and, right, yeah. you know, so it was up to me which way I wanted to go. And I was kind of going, I think I want to do more comedy. So I went back in and did another Edinburgh, but I did a thing called Edinburgh Bust, which right. people, can, people can Google that now. <laughs> <laughs> and Edinburgh Bust uh, followed uh, comedians around Edinburgh on Channel 4. Right. And uh, yeah, to see how they would cope. I think I remember you know, it, yeah. yeah. It was all new comics. It was me, yeah. I think Adam Bloom was one of the other ones, yeah. Stephen Grant. Yeah. I can't remember who, I can't remember the other ones are. But anyway, that was, so they followed us around. And so immediately we were, all, we were known all over uh, Channel 4 and all over Edinburgh. So my gigs just sold out immediately because they see, because what happens was yeah. it was on once a week. Of course. So after the first week, um, when I played a, an underground gig, um, it was called The Cavern in the Pleasance Courtyard. Sure. Uh, and in that year, I mean, I just, I, I just can't believe. I mean, I literally, I mean, you're making me just want to go, I should really write a book about all this. It's too much. <laughs> so I'm in there. I'm in every chair. You, you can do, you can interview me. We'll just ghost write it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm in there. I'm very happy right? to do that. <laughs> I'm in there one of the nights and the cavern is like packed out and every time I do it and funny all I can hear from the sound desk is oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it's me oh, oh, oh. yeah no it wasn't you but anyway and uh, afterwards it was uh, Peter Senevenovich you know Peter Senevenovich oh yeah brilliant yeah the Peter laughs like that he goes oh, oh, oh. Wow. and Peter's best friend was was uh, was Robert Popper who ended up being a great friend of mine and yeah. he went on to write um, Friday yeah, night dinner. Friday night dinner, yeah, yeah. And I ended up staying a few wow. times with Robert in Ke in a Ke in Kilburn. Right. Like I kind of mixed around like an Irish tramp around London when I stayed there. I stayed <laughs> in Kilburn with Graham Lenehan, who wrote yeah. Father Ted, and and that was a flat owned by Griff Reeve Jones. I then stayed with Robert Popper down the road, where I used wow. to sit and watch him ring radio shows live at night wow. and pretend to be these different characters, which was hilarious. Wow. And then I stayed with Simon Pegg and um, Nick in their flat in um Close. theirs wasn't kentish town it was near camden right I don't know the name of the road and and there's a there's and simon has footage of us doing city sketches in his house wow. simon did um me and a girl called janie we, we we pretended to look around the house like we wanted to buy it and simon simon played a mishap type of uh of estate agent he's, he's uh, sorry accident prone sorry and he just kept falling downstairs and falling through <laughs> things so. and then uh, here we go comic. i mean <laughs> and then to, to, to the Simon connection was that Arthur Matches and Graham Lennon came to see me do a gig in London and Simon was doing the gig with me because sure. me and Simon are the same agent. Yeah. They seen Simon, they loved the look of him and the way he was and all. And then they cast him in Hippies, right. which was a sitcom on, on, on TV. It might have been a Channel 4. Yeah. Um, they'd already done T Father Ted. Mm -hmm. So they did Hippies. And then they did Big Train with yeah. Simon, uh -huh. which did really well. And then yeah. Simon wrote spaced yeah he then did spaced and then i kind of didn't see simon and nick for ages until i was in kentish town where i was staying right. simon and nick were sitting in a little green sports car we eating mcdonald's and i went what the fuck and <laughs> <I> went, jason <laughs> i said what are you doing and simon goes 
we're writing a zombie movie. Can you believe somebody's <laughs> given us money to write Brilliant. a zombie movie? And the and rest they're writing... is history. Yeah. Wow, so wow, like, wow. That's um, just such a small circle of people. Oh, it's incredible. Um, uh, let me read this out to you because this is, this is quite a long question. I've been going to the Edinburgh Fringe for years and I always make a point of seeing you. I design a spreadsheet for loads of friends who come and join me and I always look ah. out for when your show is on and you're, you're top of the list to see. The oh. first show I saw was the lovely Goat Show in 2005 and oh, the yeah. last one I saw was Wreck But Ready in 2019. You are the biggest selling comedy act at the Fringe. I have cried laughing at so many memorable performances of your inspired title shows. One of my favourite ever things you did was um, we were in the um, the uh, assembly on the mound. Assembly and, hall. Uh, somebody was late for the show. You'd done about 15 minutes. You had two people on stage running around with books and doing daft games and everything. Somebody was late for the show. You stopped the show. You dragged the latecomer onto the stage, stood him on the stage and completely rewound the show. And I'd ne <laughs> I nearly had to be taken to hospital. I was laughing so hard. Oh, you good, just got yeah. a magic do I remember the wrecking ball. Oh, the <laughs> wrecking ball. The when, when I swung out on the wrecking ball in the family hall, it was like, that was my favorite entrance ever. Even my own my yeah. own mother even went, I don't think you'll ever find a better entrance. No. Like, oh, thanks, ma'am. But is, I flung out all, over the audience in the assembly hall, like over their heads. Yeah. And th there had to be a lawyer present every night. Anyway. <laughs> the, the question from all this is, how do you come up with your ideas for your shows? Oh, my God, do yeah. You I mean, a, a, do you have a way of doing it? Do you... Does I have a kind of I have an animated brain, right. so I, I I do stand up and I, and I and I also don't have um my, my like my memory with words is not brilliant, so I have a t slight dyslexia as well, right. so I can't really uh, you know learn off a load of words. So sure. I'll I'll know stories. It, my stories in my head. Well, I mean, I draw them down from my family life and you know, a lot of my stand up -y stories that come from my dad and like all yeah. those stuff and everything. And, like That's all the stand up -y bits. But then I have this other weird thing is where I'll do these silly stunts that I just like and I was going, I'll do magic stunts. And then I went, what magic stunts is there? Oh, yeah, there's like levitation and so on people. In hell. <laughs> and then I just get loads of car. I said, I'm so brave, like you say, I bring bits of cardboard on with uh, bits of sellotape and then the, the that on the first night is a disaster like nobody's laughing they're all wondering what i'm doing and there's cardboard falling apart people rolling around out of boxes and there's nothing working and then i go and do it again and again until i actually have honed down um that that actual stunt right uh, props and people because i'm really good with people i always make them feel good yeah, i turn yeah. them into stars uh, and people's memories, yeah. I mean, I've, I once got the uh, Scottish swimming team to swim across the stage <laughs> in, in Edinburgh, uh, which because I did a guy, guys, because the Commonwealth Games were on or something, yeah, and they were yeah. using the um, the Edinburgh pool as the diving thing. And I says, God, did anybody see the Scottish team when they land in the water? Because their skin is so blue, you can't see them. You don't know. You don't know. <laughs> You don't know if they come up or not. And someone went, I'm part of the Scottish team. And the rest of the audience obviously went, oh, you fucking idiot. So that was it. I had four of the Scottish team, like in their clothes, of course, just yeah. dragging themselves across the stage. So I've had so, so, so I'll do that. Um, and I mean, and one year, uh, my promoter said to me, Ed Smith, why don't you put your set list on the stage? I think people think you completely make everything up, and it's just, and, but you don't. You have your set stunts, you've got your lovely stand-up, you have your bits that you do definitely make up when you talk to the audience. So that so one of my favourite shows is when I put a wheel on the stage. That yeah, was actually yeah. the... Sorry, that's the, that's the Wrecking Ball show. Oh, yeah, it was you named the show where I had the audience... That's could right, make yeah. And I had the set list on the fucking wheel and people listening was, so I spun the wheel and wherever it landed, I had to do that bit of material, even if I did it already. And then and the, the record in Edinburgh is, I did the Wrecking Ball entrance six times. <laughs> in an hour. But the crowd were like loving it. Like, it I hope you were insured. When they landed on entrance, they all went, yeah. and went joking. <laughs> so the poor sound man, the poor sound techie man, it took him about three or four days to get used to, you know, going backwards and forwards and backwards and doing this. And then we, and then it had finale written on it. Right. And once I had, I had to do the finale at the start of the show. 
Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, brilliant. I just love all that deep end, oh. deep end excitement that Wonderful. keeps people on the edge of their seats. You know, it's it's a and what I'm doing is I'm it's I always say when I do my gigs, I I go on stage with a blank canvas, and at the end there's a whole picture drawn. Do you know what I mean? With the help of the audience. On your on your posters every year, it it, it always says uh, the king of live comedy, and I yeah, look my at mom, the poster my mom wrote and, that. I, and I smile <laughs> and I think it's so true. It it, it it's highly highly recommended your live show. Um, mm. Let's move on. I have read your book Adventures of a Wonky Eyed Boy, yeah, and I genuinely think it is the best book I've ever read about growing up because it reminds <laughs> me so much of my childhood in Carlisle wearing yeah. these glasses yeah uh, is your process of writing a book different to writing stand-up comedy ah yeah totally right because i would bring the comedy onto the stage and i bring the idea on because as i was saying with the writing and stuff and then with the that book was was good because i was able to i was remembering and basically doing what i'm doing with you now i was going back in years and remembering stuff that happened with my so what I'm doing right there is I'm sitting in front of a computer, but I'm actually seeing my mom and dad do things, Brilliant. seeing my teachers do stuff. Yeah, I can still see things when I was a kid. Like my memory's amazing that way. Brilliant. So then I will de then I transform that down onto paper as much as I could because so what I'm doing first of all is I'm so I so sorry with the book we actually I wrote out all the head like the like the pointer like the head headers you know what I mean like pointers yeah yeah you know but and did it all in chronological order and then I went Went back and wrote you know the dialogue in there that might for my dad to be speaking like when i fell off the swing or i got knocked down or when my mother had to be rushed to hospital in a bread van <laughs> having a baby and do you know what i did I, I did a lovely show called the good room and one of my comics was yeah. on and she said that in ireland and this is how you know it, it's sad for this kind of neighborly stuff to be gone because of uh, health and safety so health and safety and insurance and fucking pc and everything has kind of ruined neighborhoods because everybody's afraid to do anything because everybody thinks they're going to get sued or you'll be like even when i do a, a, an interview with a journalist now I, yeah. I there's no there's no point because they're just trying to catch you out so they can get a headline so it's like a waste of everybody's time yeah, so yeah. then somebody reads the article they go yeah that wasn't great i go yeah but that's because i can't actually say what i want to say yeah. So um, what happened was in this neighborhood, Sue Collins told me this lovely story. She's a comedian and she said that uh, in Ireland, uh, there was a, a guy had this had a car in the neighborhood and one day at mass, he just told everybody that he'd just leave the keys in the car and because there was so many women having babies and they didn't have cars. A lot of the, the husbands didn't have cars. So that <laughs> car always had the keys in it and the husband could just jump into it and drive them to the hospital and oh, have their baby. fantastic. And can you imagine like now? <laughs> Sorry, no, not insured. Sorry, you could actually, no, no, you could actually, oh, fuck off. You know what I mean? What a lovely thing to have. That's fantastic. I know, it's so drives well me written. mad. It, it, um, exactly the same. Um, where, where, where I live in Carlisle, everybody knows everybody else. And it mm. was the magic of that that came through in the book. Um, uh, just, just a wonderful, wonderful read. It's yeah. behind me now on my shelves. Um, oh. uh, um, we're all living in strange times. Um, it's been a, it, it, it's been a horrible eighteen months. But thank God for mm. online comedy, and thank God for what you do on online. You've personally helped me a great deal. I've lost a lot of weight. Uh, during oh. lockdown through exercise and your entertainment what <laughs> what keeps you inspired oh um i suppose uh like i've got like loads of little voices in my head all the time you know what i mean so i have ones that go i'll oh, just stay in bed who gives a shit and then i've got the other voices <laughs> that go no come on come on come on come on i've got like the fun and um, there's a thing like because i do a lot of stuff with mental health we all have our inner yeah, child yeah. And it's a, it's a shame when people's inner, like most of our inner child is kind of quashed and the flame is put out in school, which is funny. I mean, isn't that mad? It's school that does that. <laughs> so um, a great guy who uh, wrote, wrote a book called The Element, which is Sir Ken Robinson. And, he, and The Element is what he's talking about, like kind of having that fire, that child in you. So I, that child never died inside of me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and like th That's it, lovely. That's wonderful. Yeah and, yeah. and so when I'm sitting around during the lockdown, my inspiration was, was not really that, oh my God, I seen something on the telly and I, I feel like I should really do that. There's this thing in me fucking chest. And let's go, can we do something today? Can we do something today? Can we do something? Come on, can we do something? So I have to keep that happy by physically exercising, meditating, or just putting a wig on and doing a silly sketch in front of in, in me toilet. 
villa or doing it or uh, as you as you've seen i did I, I came up with a city quiz show yeah, yeah. which i ended up doing my quiz show to corporate to corporate game. i was doing a quiz show in a toilet to aviva and then to, <laughs> like insurance and then i was doing one to the and then i had like over a thousand people on the, on the british national grid watching me in the irish toilet doing a quiz show and that's all, brilliant what's, what's happened? <laughs> But that's my inner child that creates all that, you know. That's the that's the magic of your act, though, because um, you're so original. You never know what's going to happen next, and that's what keeps audiences watching. And that's a great point because I don't know. No, because sometimes, <laughs> and, and I can I can feel when I'm holding back my inner child yeah. on my brain on my play, um, and when I hold it back, the gig is not as good. And I but right. if I just. It's insane to to me for me to trust myself because I I can go off into all sorts of mad cul de sacs of non funniness, but my brain and my inner child is literally looking at me going, just trust us, Jason. All right, <laughs> we're, we're going to look. We may not be getting anywhere right now in this in these two minutes right now, but we're going to get somewhere. Just keep fishing. Don't don't. And this is the magic because my friend Barry Murphy always said to me whenever he watched me doing a gig. I'd come off stage and he'd either say to me, magic or no magic. Do you know what I mean? And exactly, he was a comedian yeah, friend of mine. Yeah, and he'd yeah. just go, he'd go, yeah, no magic tonight. And i go, nope. <laughs> and, then, and that's because I would have held back. And yeah. then I'd come off and he'd be going, magic, magic, magic. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, who are you, you've made me laugh so much over the years. Who are your favourite comedians, past mm. and present? Yeah, again, I mean, I've been asked this a lot. There, there's so many, you know what I mean? Because... I um you know because it's the storytellers the sketch guys the whatever I mean the one liners um you know I like I, you know comedians we love evil comedy we love when we can see evil comedy because especially when I can't really do it so I love watching Frankie Boyle and Jimmy uh, Carr yeah. do you know what I mean yeah. I love what Frankie go I go oh my god and that's just like brilliant and then um and then I uh, and and still Dil, Dylan Moran or Dylan oh, Moran do you call yeah, him yeah 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 like to watch Dylan, Dylan's craft with language is just unbelievable. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just you, you uh, say you were saying before about Billy Connolly is the same mm. where they just take one word and fly mm. with it. It's yeah, it's extraordinary. And Billy Connolly is like that. Is, yeah. I'm, I'll never meet him. It's sad because he's so ill now or whatever. Well, he's whatever. He's not. I wouldn't say ill. He's just got Parkinson's. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's, it's just a thing he has. Yeah. But I, I, he has no idea how much inspiration he had on me because yeah. he's the first stand up I ever seen. Yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I'd never seen one ever before him. Right. It's like wow. And I remember coming out with mate going, oh, "I am never doing that. That's so brave." <laughs> <laughs> I was going, he, I was going, he's on his own. Because I was, I was in a box in a. Oh, I owed. Oh, by the way, I owe, I owe him a ticket because we snuck in. Me and my mate, we only right. sixteen. <laughs> We snuck into the boxes because we knew there'd be nobody in the boxes. So we could see the audience, you see, looking at him. So right. we're watching them laughing at him. It's going, that's brilliant. And he was so funny. So oh, him, I've seen um, him I don't want to leave anybody else. And actually, Dylan Moran's one of his lovely lines was, um, I was in Canada doing a Montreal and he was doing a, the gala and he came out and he went, oh God, he goes, oh, hi, 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 hi. And all the Canadians like, oh my God, yeah, hi, hi. Because they're really <laughs> nice. You know, Canadians are so nice. And he goes, he goes, America's just next door. America is just next door. It has like, like, you know, gun crime, and the, the Canadians are like, oh, yeah, yeah, gun crime, boo. Yeah, you know, you know, it's got burglary, like rape, like, you know, murder, and like, it goes all like that. And then he just took a drag from his fag and he looks at everybody and he goes, and that's what makes this place so fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> And they all, the Canadians, the Canadians are like clapping and not knowing what to do, going, oh, shit. oh, what? Oh, okay. oh sorry. My, um, the reason why I ask you the question is that there's a section in my blog called The Ones That Got Away. And yeah. um, uh, I, I wrote about 25 of them. And, and top of the tree oh. were Morecambe and Wise, who I would have loved to have seen. My first oh. ever gig was Les Dawson in 1976. Jesus Christ. And then a year later, I saw Tommy Cooper and I got the book. <gasps> And I've seen I the two Tommy Ronnies. I've seen them. Um, You've seen them live. Yeah, I saw them at the two Ronnie sketchbook at BBC, and all the writers stood up at the end. It was Ronnie Barker's last show. He wasn't very well at all. Oh, well, that was on televised. This is the one that was televised. Where he, Christmas where he looks one. very ill. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. It was, oh. but it, but it, but he still had a twinkle in his eye. Yeah, and uh, what a great he could man. still deliver a joke. I've actually met Ronnie Corbett, uh, and uh, he oh. was just the nicest man. But yeah. the, the um, all the writers stood up, 
and applauded and I've never seen such warmth for a for a comedy bill. But what a genius, like because oh, he wrote Porridge, he wrote all the Markham and Wise, he wrote God. Open All Airs, he was yeah. like constantly writing. Just the best. But, and then and then into the eighties I saw Rick Mail and Bill Hicks was a highlight in Manchester wow. I saw him. And then I go to Edinburgh. Um and and um uh one of the comedians that I'd love to have seen was Dave Allen. I, 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 I almost had a chance to go and see him and I absolutely I thought early on he was just fantastic well I mean like that's I mean I used to funny enough I used to do my comedy like jumping around doing skits grabbing people but I wish and wish I could have done it like he did it <laughs> How, he I was going, so good. that is the coolest shit ever he's yeah, sitting there yeah, miss, yeah, he missing really a finger was. having a whiskey and a fag <laughs> and I, it was great <laughs> but I did uh, I, I I had a weird airport situation with him, where so I seen him, right? But I didn't go over to say hello to him because, right. because um, uh, this is what happened, right? I was I had done one show on television, like some stand-up show in Ireland, and it was on it was for some Amnesty or something. It was on television, but I was in an English airport, and a guy I just kind of stand there. It's the weirdest things ever happened to me, and a guy goes, "You?" Uh, he goes, "Ah, oh, uh, the comedian," <laughs> and I go like this, kind of go. He, could, he couldn't know me already. I haven't done her. And I go, I go, yeah, yeah. And he goes, yeah, yeah, the comedian. Like, literally like that to me. And I go, yeah. And he goes, is that him over there? And he points at Dave <laughs> Allen. Oh, mate. <laughs> but I didn't even see Dave Allen. And then I went, holy shit, that's Dave Allen. <laughs> so, yeah. I so always, like I, always connection. I always remember one of the first things, one of the first comedians you ever saw, like I said, was Tommy Cooper, and it, I, I remember mm -hmm. laughing so hard at him. I'd be about eight, and the curtains opened, and there's nothing on stage but a bed, and he's <laughs> lying on it, and one woman in the crowd started laughing. He hadn't done a thing, and it trickled right round, so everybody was crying with laughter. And mm. perfect timing, he just popped his head up and he went, what, what, somebody come on. <laughs> <laughs> he was great away. at that. And, and, and he, he, there was so many lovely Tommy Cooper stories. Oh. Uh, uh, Jimmy Tarbick, I remember he said once that <laughs> yeah. he, um, he brought Tommy Cooper home and Tommy Cooper was absolutely hammered. And he brought him home. I don't know if you know, remember this story. And, and they get into the, into the, into his house and Tommy got sick on the carpet. Right. And then Tommy's wife came down and just as she walked into the, into the room, Tommy took his handkerchief off and wiped Jimmy Targum's mouth. He wiped his mouth. <laughs> brilliant. And That's Jimmy Targum's getting his mouth wiped by Tommy Cooper. Tommy's going, oh, it's okay, son. It's okay, son. <laughs> That's genius. And, That's and he, genius. he was going, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we go, and yeah. I, genuinely, I could well, talk I really enjoyed to you this all week. night. Yeah. I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. It's been an absolute joy talking to you. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, where can you be found on social media? Have yeah, you got any um, online gigs planned? Have you got any podcasts? So at the Jason Byrne, it, I mean, if you ask me if I got anything planned, holy mud regard. So at the Jason Byrne is the Instagram and the Facebook. Yeah, I'll keep doing those sketches all the time. I'm going to be going back into doing the Sunday night check-ins a lot because I've hooked up with a, a charity here called... Uh, it's called Lonely, right. and they're a charity for like old people and people on their own. Right. So I hooked in with them, and then and then on the third of July, I'm going to be doing a, a webinar for like, which is a well-being day, like a seminar with different guests coming on, right. uh, and we're going to have you know, a bit of a laugh as well. Don't worry, it's not all going to be like you know, mental health <laughs> doom and gloom, and you know, right. you better eat cabbage. Are <laughs> you be miserable? Oh, Jesus. So, no, it's a bit of a lighthearted uh, web. Uh, we've called instead of a webinar, we've called it a webinar. Right. And then, oh yeah, and then I did a, like a children's sitcom for CBBC, so I played a part in that. It's called Brilliant. Almost Never. Right. That's coming up. Um, and then the British tour is back on sale, thank God. So I can't wait to get back onto that at the end. And then I've been doing, um, writing other little projects. I mean, a really weird, I can't wait to see it. That Irish television got a couple of children's writers to rewrite uh, fairy tales. Right. And my one is uh, Cinderella's Other Fella. Right. So... <laughs> Genius. And it's going to be, it's animated <laughs> and I also, I'll be narrating it as well. But this, it just never stops with, with me because that's my inner child again, you see, Rich. Yeah, it yeah, just goes, yeah. well, it's like, Jesus Christ, will you just sit down? <laughs> well, please, please, please keep doing what you do because it is extraordinary. Your online 
input is just extraordinary. Oh, you're, um, but you're great. We need you as well, you know. We have to have somebody <laughs> looking keep, at it. We need people looking at it, Rich. <laughs> and I am, I am looking forward so very much to come and see you live again very well, soon. But and you have to come up to me afterwards, like, you know. Cause I'm going to come he, and meet you, definitely, mate, because I can't believe we've never met in all the years I've seen I know, you. it's silly, isn't it? I mean, I, I mean, with the Assembly Hall, you see, I used to have my bicycle with me, and there's a back door up, up, up goes out onto the Royal Mile. And I used to just go up that way and just go out the door because I wouldn't see anybody <laughs> there. I've done it, I'm off. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'd also, uh, one year I was watching The Sopranos and I'd literally be on stage <laughs> be halfway through and I'd be going, oh my God, I wonder what happens to Tony. What the hell happens to Tony? <laughs> anyway, anyway, so, uh, and I'd be like legging at home then to fucking sit up before 4am binging. <laughs> but no, I will, uh, absolutely, yeah, I'd love that. It would, be, it would be wonderful to meet you, my friend. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute joy. No way. Uh, it's great, Rich. And you take care. All the very best to you.